the, the time now is 8 p.m. GMT. So welcome everybody to this VSA online webinar. So I'm Evgeny Osipov. And um, I hope we have many people uh, joining today. So, um, well, in the US, you change to summertime. So I expect some dropout because of that. But nevertheless, today I'm very happy to host Maxim Bajena from uh, University of California, San Diego. And actually, we um, had a pleasure to uh, to host another talk from his group. So uh, he's, uh, I assume, former PhD student, Wilkie Oli Namantop, uh, gave a presentation on HDC VSA uh, related topic. Um, but Maxim, uh, his research is not uh, in, in the area of uh, HDC VSA, so he's a neuroscientist. And I, when I heard his uh, suggested topic, I thought it's really cool. And I really, for a long time, I wanted to have um, a kind of a talk, which is a little bit on the side of our main track. So uh, let's see how it goes. Hopefully it will inspire um, some good uh, discussion. So Maxim, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks again for inviting me and uh everybody for being here. Um, as Gany said, my, my background in, in mass and I had my PhD in differential equations and then uh, master in theoretical physics. But since I moved um, to US uh, almost 30 years ago, I have been doing uh, computational neuroscience. And um, more recently, sort of what is called neuroscience inspired artificial intelligence, um, kind of in different flavors. and. Um, so sleep was um, actually the first project I started to work on, and uh, it remains um, probably the main project in the lab. And um, so in my talk, I will kind of probably spend more than half of talk just speaking in general about sleep, what we know about sleep, role of sleep and memory and learning. And um, then I will kind of more briefly summarize some of our results about uh, sort of application, some ideas. Um, from sleep research to artificial intelligence. Okay, so you see slight change, right? It's it's uh, yeah okay. So um so we know all kind of know and excited about um, kind of um, lots of fantastic things which we um getting from from AI and obviously all these NLP models recently become uh, very kind of popular, very hot topic, and um, I admit I use ChatGPT to correct my English writing, which is that much better than I do myself. There are lots of other applications, and it's all fantastic, and there are uh, a lot of uh, great developments we see now and we'll see soon and uh, going forward. But there are also um, some uh, kind of very important limitations of um, of current machine learning models. And uh, this is not a full list, but something which is we trying to kind of address in our research. Uh, the first is catastrophic forgetting. I um, actually started to work on that uh, project well, about six or seven, year, seven years ago when uh, uh, sort of uh, Department of Defense here in the US DARPA funded uh, some large program called uh, Lifelong Learning Machines, L2M. Uh, with the goal to develop um, kind of new generation of AI, which would be um, um, sort of capable of continuous learning. And um, this kind of related to well known problem of uh, those machine learning system, um, they generally unable to learn continuously. It's true for simple kind of uh, few layer network, it's true for chat GPT. Um, more you train new task, more forgetting happens with all tasks. Uh, the general lack of generalization, uh, meaning that um, if we change from a type of data and use for training to another type of data, statistically, maybe data with noise, data with, I will show some examples, uh, it leads uh, to very poor performance. Uh, there is a problem for the serial attacks when some minimal changes to the input data can change predictions of AI models. And they generally need a lot of data for training. So even simple in this data set, it's like 60,000 images, uh, almost 1,000 per class, and you usually need to train them a few times to get some decent performance. 
So this is an example of catastrophic forgetting, uh, very simple in this data set, uh, you all know that uh, handwritten digits. So if, I mean, uh, just single layer perceptron can perfectly learn these whole 10 classes and uh, kind of to 90 plus percent accuracy. Uh, however, if you train network, let's say if you divide all this data in two classes, like first four digits, five digits, and then another five digits, and train them sequentially, then you start training second task, second set, we almost immediately lose performance accuracy on the first one. Um, this is another example of the same problem. You train kind of uh, continuously one digit after another, and each digit almost immediately new training uh, leads to forgetting of the previous, uh, uh, previous data. Um, lack of generalization, this is uh, was a very nice paper uh, published in NIPS a few years ago, which shows that machine learning model can be trained on kind of each type of images and actually get very high performance on them. But once you move from one type to another, they perform very poorly. So uh, if you remember correctly how it's organized, this is, um, I think, diagonal shows um, performance, for example, this one, uh, performance when uh, network is trained on uh, images, including sulfur of pepper noise, and by itself is not a problem. It can get 80% performance. But then I go back to like standard color yeah. images and performance drops to 10%. Or you can train on those images to get 96%, but then if you show the sulfur of pepper noise images, you're down to 6.1. Uh, humans, in general, maintain much higher performance and um, uh, again, this is obviously a problem for lots of applications. Like if you train something, self driving car in clean images, uh, you will be able to recognize something in fog or rain. Uh, there's this problem of adversarial attacks, uh, little changes to the image, few pixels changing here and there can completely change a uh, prediction of the model. This kind of very famous when this panda predicted as a, as a given. But now, for us, it's obviously indistinguishable from a regional image. So, um, Again, all this problem problems are known for, for years and uh, or, or, or longer. And um, we also know that uh, humans actually are very good in um, solving those tasks. We we can learn very well just in a few examples. We don't need to see thousands of images of, I don't know, some new creature to actually be able to recognize it in different variations. Uh, we are very good in processing data that kind of uh, distorted, even if those distortions are not really uh, something found in nature. So the question is how biological systems do it. And probably there are many kind of answers which all would be correct, but uh, we believe that big contribution to that kind of advantage of um, to this performance uh, ability of humans and animals to do it well are related to sleep. So I will talk first briefly about like some ideas of sleep, kind of what we know about sleep, uh, what, then what we know about the role of sleep and memory and learning, and by the time probably we run out of time, by the end I will show some of our kind of results related to application of sleep to uh, machine learning models. Okay, so maybe one more striking, uh, at least for me, fact about the importance of sleep is that sleep is not just being complex type of electrical activity, um, so brain is activity during sleep is, I will show some uh, a bit more in details about this in a minute, but um, so those patterns, uh, those types of activity uh, which brain shows during sleep are very much stereotyped across species. So first of all, every, every living species we know basically have one form of sleep or another from like sea elegance to, to humans. If you take um, a vertebrate sort of uh, um, biological system is more developed brain, they typically will have um, same patterns, same stages. Uh, again, sleep is very complex. Usually you have lots of deep sleep uh, early in the night and then what is called rapid eye movement, um, REM sleep later. We have dreams during REM sleep. Um, uh, we, we kind of presumably have still dreams during slower sleep, but don't, don't remember them. Again, these patterns um, are repeatable, and this is a recent study, for example, of Honeybee, which shows, um, I, I'm not going into details, but 
it's identify also two types of deep and paradoxical kind of RAM, like we cannot call it RAM for beast because it's rapid eye movement. Um, terminology not, not exactly applicable, but uh, so, uh, so Honeybee shows also deep and paradoxical sleep, just like uh, just the rodents, uh, monkey humans, um, they have been identified, uh, found in some type of kind of more primitive uh, vertebrates, like uh, some lizards and dragons. I mean, lizard type dragons, not those from Game of Thrones. Um, so, um, what we, how we historically, how we study brain, we usually um, record electrical activity. This is done for probably for hundred years, and. Um, 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 what what we know from recording of electrical activity of the brain during sleep is that, like I said, there are very characteristic patterns of activity found during different stages, uh, transition between them, very characteristic, um, and the changes from normal to abnormal patterns commonly related to all kinds of diseases from schizophrenia to Alzheimer's, and uh, uh, there are changes related to age, uh, dementia, and so on. Just uh, maybe I don't need to mentioned that, but I put the slide uh, from class and teaching. So in, in a very primitive way, what EEG shows is some sort of synchronized activity of the of the brain unit. So uh, we all know the brain has uh, billions of neurons. They're all doing kind of this type of activity, spikes. And uh, this is a very toy example, which shows that if a batch of spikes are not synchronized, uh, if I average them, I will see something more or less flat. If they start to become synchronized because of whatever circuit properties or other mechanisms, they start to show some uh, high amplitude activity, which could be recorded as uh, EEG oscillations. And um, um, as I mentioned, there are very characteristic types of them. Um, but typically during sleep, we go from like wakefulness to stage one, two, three, four, which is deep sleep. And then typically back to REM, uh, well, not back to REM, to, to REM sleep when muscles are paralyzed, but brain is very active, kind of like during wake. And then we have again periods of um, transitions to stage um, two and then deep sleep three, four. Usually we spend very little time in stage one. So there are very typical patterns called sleep spindles during stage two. Um, it's not very deep sleep. It's um, about seven, 14 hertz activity, kind of about a few seconds come in every tens of seconds. During deep sleep, we have, um, um, what is called um, slow wave or delta waves. It's it's very slow activity, and this is intracellular recording. So this is what single neuron is doing for hours in our head when we are sleeping. It goes between active states and silent states, active and silent. And there is a very complex dynamics, and um, like thousands of labs have been studying it for a long time, and essentially we understand quite well what what's happening there. Now. Um, so sleep, obviously, maybe not obviously, but have been shown over years playing lots of functions in um, in, in biology and physiology of uh, living systems. Um, it's important for immune system response. It helps to clear some kind of uh, garbage from our extracellular space in the brain, which, uh, if it's not working well, have been related to Alzheimer's disease. But one function of sleep which was kind of identified and shown very well in different studies from, from again, from animals to humans is um, a role of sleep and memory in learning. I'd like to put this example, a dramatic um, uh, example. This is, um, um, there was a BBC video a few years ago about uh, interesting and unfortunate kind of disease, which was been developed a couple hundred years ago in, in, in some very, it's a very small population, literally few people in the world have it. It's some, it started with some mutation in, in thalamic cell in an um, Italian family. And um, the result of this mutation is that um, some protein doesn't fold properly. And uh, essentially, uh, people who suffer from that cannot go to deep sleep. It's also important to say that this disease, for some reason, it's kind of dormant till age of 20 plus. And suddenly it's showing up and, and people are dying within a few and months. And other patients performing gestures like combing their head or washing their hands or handling objects. Silvano and the others were unable to drop into a deep well sleep 
and sleep medications only accelerated their restless descent or death. We gave an intravenous doses of blood vitamins in an attempt to help the patient sleep. So, um, again, this is very um, kind of dramatic example, and one of the first manifestations um, of this disease is a memory loss. So, um, a little bit what we know about memory, um, just single term memory is not really reflecting um, complexity of this topic. Uh, there are different types of memory uh, in generally divided into two classes, declarative, which is kind of memory facts and events, um, and uh, non-declarative, but typically, typically example would be uh, some, some skills like running a bike, playing tennis. So presumably it's involved different um, subsystems. I will very briefly show, um, show you some, um, some kind of um, summaries of that. But so study of sleep, at least on a level of um, kind of not necessarily neurophysiology, but this is some lots of work of that kind have been done with humans when, for example, somebody trying to learn word, pair, word pairs. And then um, uh, first word is presented and performance tested on, on completion. And this is an example. Uh, we always have a forgetting if, if there is some period of time between encoding and, and, and testing. But typically forgetting is less, significantly less, if there is a period of slow wave sleep between encoding and testing versus some staying awake. It doesn't, um, for example, REM doesn't affect it much, but REM improves um, again skill performance. So if we play tennis and then we have a sleep, then presumably next morning we, uh, next day we should do it better, even if it doesn't work for me at all. Um, so there are some um, data on pharmacology. For example, this is using some uh, drugs, Zolpidem, which uh, increase density of spindles. This is um, uh, drug condition, this is control. And memory performance is higher in a subject who had a sleep uh, under that condition. There are some different stimulation techniques. Um, there are lots of efforts in direction. It's not invasive, potentially, which can enhance slow waves. This is, for example, uh, from Jan Borg group in Germany. It shows um, uh, stimulation was applied to increase kind of slow oscillation. So this is black one is control and red is um, result of stimulation applying closed loop matter at some phase. Um, I think it was auditory tones, which uh, again, kind of non-invasive. And you can see that performance after having that is uh, in, in condition of the stimulation is higher than in, in the sham. So in summary, um, like I mentioned earlier, sleep is, is very complex. Maybe this is the one message uh, if, if you take home if nothing else works my presentation. So there are different types of activity like slow waves, um, spindles, uh, hippocampal sharp wave ripples. They have different frequencies. They're generated by different systems um, like cortex, thalamus, hippocampus. And there is a complex organization of those. So not even if we suppress or in those experiments can be done, some of this rhythm, but if you break kind of coordination between or kind of nesting of those oscillations, it would have a negative impact on memory. Okay, so how, how it works? There are two basically main, I would put it principles or um, elements of sleep, which we think are playing a role in um, memory and learning. So the first one is that um, if there are certain, if our memories are represented by, if our experiences are represented by um, patterns of cell spiking, I will show you example in a second, then technically those patterns can be replaced continuously during sleep. Uh, it's called memory play. So if you remember movie Inception, this is essentially what kind of ideas they uh, very nicely explore. And in fact, um, data shows that this replay can happen at faster scales than, uh, than original kind of uh, encoding type of learning pa uh, patterns. Second, um, so if cells spike in close proximity to each other, they trigger plasticity, which change synaptic weights between them. So essentially, sleep allows to rewire a uh, brain network. So it's kind of need two elements. It needs previous experience to kind of tag or somehow label what should be involved in, in replay or possible rewiring, and it needs plasticity to actually do it. Um, one huge difference 
very important and potentially related to some of the problems of machine learning models I mentioned is that uh, plasticity in the brain is generally local. So it's not like the crop is working when essentially error propagates the system and uh, everything is updated to, to minimize it. Uh, typically, most kind of um, fundamental principle of plasticity uh, called Hebian one and more specific uh, implementation of this is spike timing dependent plasticity is essentially uh, works between two cells in a single synapse. If if these two cells spike in order cell one, cell two, the synapse getting stronger. If cell one spikes after cell two, presumably then it spikes is kind of not relevant for cell two spiking. Then uh, it leads to uh, depression of that synapse. So in that sense, if we have a neural network and we learn some, um, again, some patterns, activity propagates for this network, maybe kind of like in, in again machine learning network, and the synapses between those cells can can change. So the idea is that the ones that get changed during sleep, the same patterns can be repeated spontaneously, and um, uh, it can sort of reorganize and or enhance um, and do lots of other potentially useful things to those memory traces. Kind of one simple example, if um, have been shown, um, there are well-studied place cells in the hippocampus, it's cell which spike at specific location in the, in the maze. This is a very simple version, like linear track. And if this mouse kind of runs for linear track, uh, this cell spike in specific order because this cell would have maybe a place field here and this cell here. So they spike uh, four, two, three, no, four, two, one, three. And um, so if they spike in that order in close proximity, synapses between those cells will change. And um, they can I kind of mentioned then during sleep, the same pattern can, can be repeated. So this is a cartoon illustrating that kind of uh, naive yeah. network, nothing is learned, then animal learns some path in the maze to get from entrance to the piece of cheese. And it needs to know where to turn right or left. So which cell should, like, this is maybe a right turn, this is left turn, but uh, it knows it needs to turn right. So it's learns it. And then during sleep, the same pattern would be repeated. And um, like I said, would be repeated at um, somewhat compressed time scale, um, which is called which is called replay. And once they once this repeat this replay is happening because again we have cells spiking in in specific order, the synaptic connection from one cell to another can uh, can change. This is a, a data illustrating the same cartoon um, on, the, on the right. It shows hippocampal cell. Um, this is from um, now more than 10 years ago, um, uh, this papers. And um, what we see is the cell spike in, in specific order is as, um, uh, this animal moving through the maze. And then during sleep, the same patterns of activity are repeated um, uh, in, in the same again, order, just on looks like compressed scale. It is hippocampus, this is this is cortex. Um if I mentioned that um in essence, if if you okay, I'll go back to that. So I mentioned that um there are different types of memories, um memories called um, um declarative memories, which are memories of fact and events and procedural, which is um sort of um uh, skills and usually we learn uh, procedural much slower. So um, we also know that those two different types of memory generally involved uh, kind of different types of encoding and um, one involving uh, declarative memory formation is is particularly interesting. There is a this notation of dual memory system which um, uh, kind of making a sense in 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 the simple terms. What happens when we learn facts and events, first is our hippocampus, which encodes this information. And cortex is, is less plastic and it doesn't really want to change yet, which is making sense. We don't want to mess up with all memories. Uh, but then during sleep, when sensory input is absent, there is interplay between cortex and hippocampus, between slow waves and uh, sharp wave ripples, which kind of allows to map information from hippocampus to the cortex. It's only a very nice system. Again, helps to um, minimize the void interference. Uh, one well-known example, I mean, kind of historic clinical uh, example of that is a famous patient HM, which had a, a lesion of hippocampus um, in a, kind of during um, treatment for his epilepsy. And what happens, uh, he perfectly retained memories of facts and events, like year, two year 
old or older, but he was unable to learn anything new. So he could say you hi as many times as he walked to the room and uh, introduce himself because he absolutely unable to learn new facts and events. Um, on on contrast, he was actually learn was able to learn motor skill. I think he was learning to play piano or something like this, which which kind of uh, uh, very consistent with this again idea. I mentioned that some memories maybe more hippocampus dependent and some uh, some less. Uh, so this is um, idea of um, procedural memory skills uh, again, such as playing piano, running the bicycles. And idea is the hippocampus is less involved, and uh, those memories more or less directly map to the cortex as we learn them. But this kind of happens in very slow pace. Again, possibly not to destroy something which was trained before. And um, and uh, at the end, it leads to um, forming long-term memories of, of those skills. OK, so the question um, I'm going to discuss, I think I have about 50 minutes. Um, maybe we'll finish on time. Uh, in, um, in, um, in the rest of my talk is, can we apply some ideas from uh, those uh, sort of principles we learn from neuroscience to, to machine learning. And um, I remove slides, maybe I, should, I had to keep one or two, but um, um, I think I mentioned before that historically lots of work I was doing is uh, related to computational neuroscience. And uh, so kind of transition from what we know about sleep to machine learning actually uh, had in between uh, years of efforts in my lab when we try to develop biophysical models of brain. And we're still working a lot in this direction. Those models are very nice because of can be of the direct link to experimental data. So we actually can measure something and uh, show it in the model. They're not very practical. They cannot really learn anything um, on, on a kind of type of machine learning problems, I think, Maybe the best it can do is learn some NIST um, uh, digit, but uh, not more than that. But uh, my point is that a lot of ideas, um, more mechanistic ideas, how sleep works and what it does um, to improve memories, actually um, uh, have been inspired by uh, by those uh, by those works and um, by those by, by efforts uh, when we try to develop biophysical models. But I want to jump kind of over that and um, uh, show sort of directly some of our efforts to apply ideas from sleep to uh, to machine learning. So let me go back to this um, um, example I showed you yeah, in this data set, very simple one, and um, uh, very simple network can can learn it perfectly fine. Um, and um, But if you train digits eventually, like one digit after another, we will have this catastrophic forgetting of previous uh, knowledge immediately, almost immediately after we start training a uh, new memory. So obviously it's a, it's a known problem in, in, in machine learning and um, there are different efforts to, to overcome it. Um, there is a very nice um, paper, review paper, well, it's part review, part, part research um, uh, by Van der Brand who showed kind of discuss one particular approach to uh, to solve this problem, which is called rehearsal. Um, so how it works? Uh, we know that uh, this is, this is let's say, our artificial neural network. We present some inputs, some NIST or whatever. Uh, we train it. We, we have a classifier at the end. And uh, like I said, if you train this network sequentially on one task after another, it, it will, uh, each new task will overcome kind of weights of the previous task and leads to forgetting. Um, it has been shown for a while that if we do some sort of interleaf training, in fact, training, right. if you train the whole data set, like all 10 of these digits um, in interleaf matter, so we present them kind of in random order, all of them as, as we usually do during um, training. The network is perfectly fine to train it, to, to learn this, um, uh, all these um, uh, the digits. So what rehearsal is about essentially is, is, is if the network is trained on all the, um, uh, on all data on, on on task one, let's say, we need to store some fraction of those um, um, samples of different classes, and then when we train new data, we mix them with um, 
um, with this old data. It has been shown that we don't need to store as much as needed for initial training. Um, some even small fraction of um, original data is sufficient. So we mix those and um, now when we train new data, uh, network can learn it, but at the same time, it will preserve uh, what was learned before. Obviously, it is a problem uh, of we need to store those data and uh, it might not be possible or it can become costly in long term and clearly um, and brain doesn't have a kind of uh, notebook of all the previous experiences, which we need to go back every time we learn something new. Uh, more practical model of that would involve some sort of uh, out encoder or generative model, which is trained to generate examples of old data. So yeah. it's essentially the same idea when we train new data set, we mix new samples with uh, old kind of old samples. However, these old samples in this case are not produced, are not stored and kind of taken from some database as they are generated by this model. Again, it works uh, well. And the um, problem, of course, that now we need to retrain this generative model all the time to include everything new we, we learned and kind of make sure it's um, um, capable of, uh, again, maintaining all the storage and generating all the samples we need to um, uh, for uh, for new training. There are some interesting extensions of these ideas. Um, uh, for example, um, lots of efforts have been done to figure out what kind of images we need to store. For example, it was shown that those which are more similar to what we learn are kind of more efficient in creating interference and potentially um, we, we can use mostly those, but not those which are very different. Like if we train classes of, I don't know, animals versus plants, then technically um, kind of uh, interference between them may not be that much, but if we learn some, if some examples of animals, if some animals looks like plants or whatever, then those would be creating kind of more interference and those examples we may want to bring um, uh, into new training. So this is, uh, again, this um, set of methods, it's probably most um, practical these days. It, it's, it works very well. It's, it's very powerful. Uh, again, there is a problem of uh, long-term storage. Another class of methods called regulariz uh, regularization methods. And um, one of the most famous and first one was um, um, its EWC, Elastic Weights Consolidation, proposed uh, by DeepMind uh, back in like five or six years ago. Um, uh, there is intelligent synopsis uh, model, uh, orthogonal weight modification, uh, more recent and uh, uh, more powerful. Um, the idea of all of them is essentially shown in this cartoon. So this is, if this is a distribution of our, let's say, our weights, which support task one, a problem if we train, and this is a distribution supporting task two, then problem of catastrophic forgetting can be seen very uh, kind of explicitly if, if we move from here to here in our distribution of weights which support uh, task A. Um, however, if we put certain constraining on, uh, on loss function, we can actually move instead of moving somewhere here, we can move here. And this is, would be um, sort of interception of loss landscapes. Um, it will talk a little bit more about this at the end between two tasks. And this is where we want to be if you want um, a network learn both task A and task B. So in uh, EWC, they introduce some sort of uh, constraints like weights, which identify to be more important for task A. They um, cannot change that fast. Uh, it's kind of uh, some sort of, um, uh, not completely freezing them, but slowing down quality on them. And uh, it's a bit more complex than that, but, but in essence, um, uh, it's a nice, nice approach. It works well for a certain task of continue, type of continuing learning, but not all. And actually, that paper uh, by Gide discussed them very well. They, they show that um, uh, it doesn't really work, for example, for my missed example, but it would work if we... Okay, I, I don't have time to go with it, but... Um, um, OWM uh, is, is, again, more recent approach, which proposed to, uh, to force new task to kind of... Um, um, change the weights and direction to some degree orthogonal to the uh, to the old previous learn learn task. Uh, again, don't have time to discuss it, but um, 
Uh, it's a nice model. It shows pretty good performance. Uh, and uh, to some degree, maybe what I'm going to talk for the last five minutes or seven of, of my talk, uh, actually, implication of sleep to machine learning is, is some degrees closer to that. At all time, it's also cl closer to rehearsal because it's explicitly use idea of replay. Um, so a few years ago, we, we proposed this approach when um, to, to deal with catastrophic forgetting, we call it sleep replay consolidation, SRC algorithm. Essentially, the way it works, we, um, uh, we start with network train on some number of images oh, and or whatever. Uh, we sh first showed it for fit forward networks, but more recently we, we had some results for recurrent neural networks. So, uh, so network learn n classes, then we want to train other class. So we do it and uh, it leads to catastrophic forgetting. But then we implement a sleep phase, um, which I explained in a second, which uh, organize some sort of non-driven non, non by input autonomous replay in this network. And what we show is that at the end, network can show pretty good performance for all n plus one classes. So how we do sleep, um, it's, it sounds a little bit more complex than it is in reality. So we keep totally, let's say we have some network which we have before sleep, it has certain architecture, we preserve it. We scale weights a little bit uh, in a certain way and this scaling inspired by some efforts to, you know, to run um, um, sort of machine learning networks on um, uh, neuromorphic hardware when um, it um, all this uh, kind of, uh, efforts like Laihi from Intel and, and so on, when they uh, essentially use spiking networks. So there, is a, there are ways of mapping the kind of uh, machine learning yeah. artificial kind of neural networks using like ReLU function and so on to, to spike in networks. So essentially we do this mapping we, um, and we need to do it because we want to implement local plasticity rules. So what, what the biggest changes in our network during sleep is that we Instead of using the back propagation, which had been used to train network in the first place, we introduce some local plasticity rules, a little bit simpler than STDP, which I showed you earlier. Essentially, if you have two units which both spike and we increase weight between them, if you have units, postsynaptic units spiking, but presynaptic units not, we decrease the weight. And we also feed it with noise. It could be pure noise, or could be some sort of average of everything network learned before just to make some activity in the network. So this noise propagates for the layer. Um, there are spike in here or there because we, um, uh, we replace value function by sort of heavy side to, to get a threshold kind of like how it works for, for, uh, for neurons. And um, then we collect all the spikes and we um, do some sort of back propagation in a sense when we update all the weights based on who was spiking and when. And uh, we keep doing it and uh, for a certain time, and uh, then once we finish, we map network back to sort of standard machine learning framework, and we can test uh, on all these classes, uh, uh, all the new and, and so on and so on. Okay, this is uh, kind of for the spiky network, we use some sort of uh, very simple kind of continuous ANN, or essentially it represents some simplest model of spike in the unit. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's a synchronous in the sense that there is a time constant and uh, kind of membrane voltage decay, not, not reset instantaneously like for classic machine learning. But in a sense, it's um, um, it's all can be implemented very simple way. I guess uh, it's implemented still, let's say in PyTorch and uh, it's it's more complex than it's, uh, it's much simpler than it sounds. So we, can, we showed, we, we, uh, in this paper we published a couple of years ago, we uh, did test it on, on different data sets. Um, this is an example, um, what happens if you train on, for example, a MINIS data set. So we, we take these 10 classes, divide them into um, uh, five tasks, two class per task. And uh, what is shown here, performance after each time step. So for example, we train task three, which is digit uh, four and five, we have almost 100%. Uh, we implement yeah. sleep the way I describe it, just for consistency. We don't need it really here. We damage performance a bit. Then we train uh, next task, task four, which is six or seven. Now we have 199 performance on the task, but this is catastrophic forgetting. Now everything classified as uh, six and seven. Then we implement sleep and we, as you see, we can recover lots of performance on all tasks. And um, we usually have some degradation on, on recent tasks, which is also 
uh, somewhat consistent what we know about uh, how biology works. So we keep doing it, and um, again, each new training um, essentially kills everything besides task which was just trained, and then sleep recovers it. Uh, since then, we improve this algorithm significantly. We we having like sixty plus percent performance, close to sixty eight. Uh, which is basically state of the art or close to state of the art. And uh, also you can see that some methods like uh, EWC, for example, doesn't really work for this incremental and NIST. Uh, it's still a chance, 20%. Um, so briefly, this, this approach can be combined nicely with the rehearsal methods. Uh, for example, if you reduce number of um, amount of data used for training, amount of all data, remember how rehearsal works. We uh, we keep some old data, or generate them, and mix them with new data. And the uh, less old data we use, um, lower accuracy would be. So this is a black curve shows essentially uh, the standard. Uh, this is for a mix data set. Like uh, if you use 2% of data, we down to like 40% performance from original, like almost 100. However, if you implement sleep on that, we can get significant gain in all these cases. So because it's totally kind of independent from how loss works uh, in the initial initial training, how this loss function organized and so on, uh, we can easily combine it with other approaches. Um, okay, I we, we show that one thing which sleep replay is doing is kind of reducing okay. correlations between classes. Uh, for example, this is a cross correlation between four classes, and this is um, before we apply SRC, and you see. Um, so it's basically we we let's say we have four classes, uh, four digits. And we correlate uh, um, activations in the neural network when we present uh, different versions of zero, for example, here, or uh, different versions of one. And this is between zero and one. You see that obviously diagonal is higher because um, activation is more mostly similar to what um, uh, between different samples of the same class, but it's still pretty high between classes and sleep significantly reduce uh, this uh, kind of uh, correlation between different classes. So now activity when we present zero is much less similar to activity when we present two than it used to be. Uh, the different layers, so let's keep this one. We can explicitly show that what happens during sleep is that uh, what we can do, we can identify neurons which are kind of related to, which are most active during specific tasks. So for example, when we train Digit zero, we can look which neurons in the network, I'm talking about now about uh, pure NN, most active when we present different versions of zero. So uh, if you look at those neurons during sleep, they would be in general more active than some random neurons. Or um, after training one, if you have a sleep, it's, so it's kind of going back to ideas that the same neurons which encode information, as uh, they are more active, they are involved in this kind of pattern of replay. Uh, which I, I discussed uh, like 30 minutes ago. Um, this is very interesting direction of what we're trying to understand what's going on. And uh, I don't have much time to talk about that, but this is how um, um, what is shown here in red and blue is uh, lost landscapes for the task. And um, this is uh, uh, W1, which um, sort of... Um, uh, I mean, especially that overlap, but essentially darker colors means higher higher loss. And if this is um, a high loss for task two, then this would be low loss. So this is what we want to be for task two. Uh, and this is, would be a low loss for task one. So when we do rehearsal, we, instead of moving from here to here, so uh, having low loss for task two to having low loss for task one, we are moving uh, in direction where we have some intersection of those kind of minimum of uh, intersection of those valleys in, in the landscape. And we, um, we showed that our sleep replay kind of does the same. So uh, when we do SRC, we're moving from point where um, loss is, is low for task one. Again, uh, I'm going to be mixing one and two here, but I think I, I hope you can follow me. Uh, obviously, they kind of La high loss for one fun and high loss for another one would be in different parts of the kind of this weight space. And we want to be in the intersection of those and this is where we go um, uh, under a kind of uh, during the sleep-like replay. Okay, we'll skip this. Just last two, 
kind of two minutes. Um, what I discussed so far was related to um, a role of sleep replay to improve continuous learning, to avoid catastrophic forgetting. More recently, we also show that we can get improvement uh, for generalization. This is, for example, uh, when we train network on uh, clean images and we try to test it and um, images kind of uh, uh, disrupted by Gaussian noise or uh, speckle noise. And we, we showed that um, this is baseline that generally if we apply SRC, network is generalized much better from clean images to the noisy one. And we show that it's related to some nice thing it does to um, to uh, convolution filters. Um, so it's also was applied in this case to uh, sort of uh, CNN. Let's keep that one. Very last slide. Uh, I mentioned that uh, artificial neural network requires lots of data in general for training. And um, uh, this is an example when we train network on MNIST. This uh, blue is baseline. You can see that once we go beyond below 10% of data, uh, performance drops significantly down to like uh, around 20% or something, which is basically a chance. So, um, so sleep can apply in sleep after training without any access to new data can significantly boost performance in this range. Again, there is some kind of some loss at high values, but we can overcome it using some fine tuning. Um, we, we had a paper about that. Um, so I guess my point with last two, two things is that um, the same sleep algorithm kind of shown to be useful and working well uh, for solving multiple tasks. And this is some kind of nice because this is what we know about sleep. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we believe that sleep helping with lots of useful um, things related to memory and learning. And uh, that's what we kind of see here. So um, I guess I'm just trying now five minutes over, but not so bad. So obviously people who did the work um, uh, now in the past in the lab and um, uh, our support and um, uh, thank you very much. Maxim, thank you very much for this exciting talk. Um, so now uh, the floor is open for questions. Please unmute yourself and speak up. So, or raise a hand. So, let's see. Uh, so, Gil, so you. Yeah. Unmute it yourself. Please go on. Yeah, um, Maxim, thank you. Um, this is kind of along some of the lines that uh, we've been researching. Um, I'm wondering, is this along the lines of uh, self-organized memory? Um. It kind of, um, I'm kind of my my. My immediate link in my memory is this all organized structures and patterns back in time when I was doing nonlinear dynamics and all this Ginsburg Landau and set of equations. But um kind of I think it's it's um it's interesting perspective. So what what we know I did not mention that, for example, from our um, work using biophysical models, uh and this may be relevant to addressing your question. So if you have two tasks and um, we have a given amount of synaptic resources which can accommodate one task or another task or both, if we uh, just keep training one task or another, network naturally fall into a situation when all resources are allocated to that single task. You can think about this all synapses, all the neurons, so on, uh, mix of those. What we found, what we showed that uh, sleep replay provide very interesting way, um, actually better than interleaf training, to um, to break, to divide resources between different memories, as long as obviously we need some initial amount of training, otherwise uh, network wouldn't know what to, to kind of to, to try to, uh, to represent. But um, um, so this is kind of another perspective of how sleep helps to avoid catastrophic forgetting. So yes, it's in, in a sense, it's organized a network. It's organized it, um, to allocate given amount of resources to each task. And uh, what we showed that 
it does it in a complex way. Some, some synapses now become allocated task one and some other synapses to task two, even though they kind of um, could be even potentially between the same neurons or same groups of neurons. In reality, probably much more complex than that. Um, that's why I, as the original conception of sleep replay was about consolidation, kind of just improving memory. The way I like to think about that, that sleep does consolidation of new memory and the reconsolidation of old memories, which means that if we learn something at some point and we maybe allocated everything available to us at that time to that memory, then later representation of that memory will keep changing to still being available and still allow for new um, tasks, which somehow become possibly overlapping with old one to, uh, to be represented. So, um, I mean, obviously it's hand-waving and I, I don't have any direct proof besides some work I mentioned, but yes, I would say that maybe it's some sort of self-organizing um, activity driven by all these oscillations going on during sleep to optimize the representation of memories. How this function, optimization function works and how brain knows it uh, on kind of larger scale, I don't know. Sorry, it's a long answer for a short question, but um, that's how I see it. Have you ever thought about using hypervectors as the memory elements, if you will? Uh, we, I mean, we, at some point we, um, Try with Wilkie to develop those ideas, um, and um, and it it kind of didn't lead too far. What what we're trying to explore, and maybe in more theoretical sense, and it's not exactly what you're saying, but it, it's close. We're trying to explore ideas that kind of geometric representation of memories. So the way again, I like to think about that. Um, if you look at the synaptic weight space, it's not a single point representing given memory. There are possibly multiple points. Uh, I can call them manifold, which would be obviously uh, kind of, um, there's no proof that technically manifold or whatever, but some subspace, which represents that memory. And this is, um, uh, would be representation of memory A. And then uh, there is another subset, some, some, some subspace representing memory B, and uh, kind of how sleep allows the system to move from one to another. I had this uh, little cartoon, which I didn't show, uh, this one. So what we show, this is again, this is memory one and this is memory two manifold, which also can be seen as a, as a, as a loss, kind of this value of the loss function. Then what I showed you to some degree was taking this situation, training memory two, if you retain it, we end up in here, but sleep allows us to end up in the intersection of those. What we really want to do, and we, we think this dual memory system does it, not even moving that far away from original memory kind of manifold, but kind of converging towards intersection, staying still close to the, uh, to the old memory manifolds. So I, I know, by the way, I'm not answering your question, and um, my, yeah, uh, uh, but, this is the direction we are trying to explore and kind of both in machine learning and biophysical models, which um, kind of maybe bit related to, to, to what you're asking. Thank you. Some more questions? Well, I guess uh, in the, uh, I mean, if I just follow myself uh, a comment again, so probably it's uh, too, uh, a little bit too superficial uh, reflection on, on what you have presented, but uh, um, in the area of HDC, we say, uh, so we, we are working with this associative memories. And uh, so, for example, uh, Penty, a long time ago, suggested this uh, long uh, a model for long term memory, like uh, sparse distributed memories. But what I what I'm trying to say is that um, it's still kind of um, of inspiring what you what you say. That I mean, it's an interplay between this long term memory and associations, and maybe kind of 
separation of encoding of uh, input and storing not the full patterns, but some enc encoded versions for, for replay. I don't know. They just lose thoughts, uh, you know, spitting out. Uh, uh, like hey, I think um, if you try, if you're trying to make kind of parallels between brain and machine learning, um, up to the point of let's say convolutional layers and so on, there is more or less a good analogy with like, uh, for example, visual formation process uh, from Talamus to V1, V2, V4, etc. But once we go to high level um, to, uh, to a social cortex, this is where uh, essentially what what we know about machine learning not really applicable at all to what we know about brain and, and vice versa. Hmm. So yeah. uh, does it mean there are better way to do it than machine learning? I mean, I don't know, maybe our existing hardware limit us to what is what what we are doing and it's 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 a bad best practice and because brain dealing with very noisy, very undeniable, it's another thing. I mean if you think about that, I mean all this spiking events are probabilistic, all synapses are unreliable. And um, um Somehow they 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 organize themselves to uh, to create very precise representation of what we learn. In fact, uh, uh, there is not direction we're excited about forgetting. I mean, um, we think about forgetting as a lack of ability to learn, but um, in fact, it has been shown that brain is perfectly capable of uh, keeping all information, um, particularly related to a specific subject. It was well studied group about maybe hundred people. They cannot forget anything. If you ask them what happens 23 years ago, Monday morning, 7 a.m., they will tell you exactly I was eating this two eggs, I was reading a newspaper about something. Uh, so forgetting is an active process as we understand it now. So how brain decides what to forget? And, and by the way, this is of people not really successful, at least apparently in marriage, because who wants to remember <laughs> what yeah. was happening? Uh, um, anyway, um, and and um, but we have a recent project on that. We're trying to understand how sleep involvement in in, in forgetting, and that's um, it, it's. It, I think it's super exciting. And uh, at the end, what we learn from brain, hopefully, can be mapped one way or another to kind of future engineering implementation, and uh, uh, and so on and so on. Thank you, Maxim. Uh, more comments, thoughts? Yes. Um, we um, are, are you familiar with um, is it uh, Matthew Walker's book Why We Sleep, the twenty seventeen book? Yeah, yeah. I need to read it again, but um, it's um, it's a little bit more less mechanistic perspective. What what what? we are doing but um anyway but yes so well what we're finding is is that um using the hyper vectors is a very interesting way of preparing a, a self-organized memory and that uh, so so far what we've learned is that uh, the brain actually um, has a capability of perfecting long-term memory. And it's through the interaction of uh, short-term being um, the hippocampus transfer um, during the sleep. And we're, uh, we're, we don't have any real data on this yet, but um, we're working along those lines and we're also finding that uh, a uh, the brain actually perfects memory over time and so we also think that that is uh, maybe a defect of uh, the learning process is the forgetting is that it also um, basically will take long-term memory and perfect uh, small parts of, of of the memory and we're thinking that the close closer that we get to it, um, the more it's beginning to look more hyper vector uh, capable than it is, uh, uh, if you will, uh, deep learning um, for the solution. The other point that we're, we're really 
we're nowhere near what I would call you know uh, going. But uh, the other point is is that uh, it does allow a very fine vernier or granularity of memory um, within the digital world, if you will. And so we're, we're into the, that point right now that we're experimenting with um, actually making such a memory in software. So it's just the kind of a, an interesting mm -hmm. uh, point that we've uh, come to at this point. It's working out. I, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about this future, but uh, mm -hmm. we're nowhere near the the point that so you guys some, uh, Just uh, again, like like I said earlier, I mean, there are lots of interest now in machine learning, right? How to organize some sort of forgetting which will allow more optimal uh, learning in long term. And uh, in the brain, it's clearly um, there are specific, like what I mentioned about what everything pretty much I would describe related to non-REM sleep. It's a sleep when we have those um, kind of uh, slow waves, uh, we have sharp ripples interacting with the hippocampus, uh, hippocampus sharp ripples interacting with cortex actively, doing this mapping and so on. But then there is a REM sleep, right? When which is from memory perspective is uh, much less understood. As a general notion is um, idea that during non-REM sleep, we kind of trying to replace those more specific and most recent kind of elements of memory, of yes. learning and, um, and so on and so on. But during REM, uh, it had been shown there is this uh, pruning, right? That kind of changing possibly kind of what is considered to be noise being, being raised. And potentially we we trying to replay much bigger episodes. That's kind of why we uh, have this all these long dreams when we trying to embed our um, kind of new knowledge to the brain work of what we learned before. Uh, but point is that brain and and this is what what amazes me is again it's very stereotyped. It's uh, across pieces that this organization we have in non-REM sleep and REM sleep and maybe REM sleep is more about forgetting and non-REM sleep is more about um, kind of learning recent events and um, replaying them. Um, and what you mentioned about hyperweight, I mean, it's it's super interesting. I, I, I would like to learn more about that because uh, like I said, so we, the problem to some degree, everything we know about role of sleep and memory and learning kind of limited by a couple of ideas, like idea of replay, idea of uh, dual memory system. There is this uh, idea of indexing when hippocampus provides some sort of indexing connecting dots in the cortex. But in the theoretical kind of sense, we don't have significantly much more than that. So whatever could be kind of framework to understand in more general, more theoretical sense, what happens in, in the brain, uh, during sleep and why we need all these phases and so on is is extremely exciting. I agree. Uh, yeah, uh, we. I, I see that Dmitry has yeah. unmuted yeah. himself. So, uh, uh, Maxim, thank you very much for your very interesting talks. Uh, just uh, two brief questions, and uh, you, <clears throat> as I understand, you use both gradient learning and Habian learning in different part of your systems. Yes. Yeah. And so you, at the same time, learn some features by gradient propagation and do some other things. But uh, what if what if along the lines that uh, Evgeny mentioned, what if the memory is associative memory like proposed by Penty or Hopefield network? that allows one shot uh, learning we we use this approach because uh, um, because i want to do to make something which actually um, works in a sense and uh, we, we have some um efforts in fact about hotel networks and um kyle kind of more complex version of popular networks um and i think it's a good uh good model at least conceptually still for again associative cortex and um, um the reason going back to the point why we use like web prop to train network in the first place and then um having learning to big sleep is because we 
still cannot really train network on even reasonably complex task using something beyond backpropagation. There are some works. In fact, I'm I have a postdoc coming in a month who had some interesting work using local. There are some efforts to use local plasticity to train kind of real data sets on real networks. And uh, we, we hope to, to try it. But but essentially, again, that prop is still best to, to train network in the first place. On the other hand, we need local plasticity to simulate what sleep does. And actually, what we mentioned, it's created a problem. Because um, in, in real biology, it's all kind of very nicely organized. We have same learning rules, same mechanism working during wake and sleep. So if rat goes in certain order and cell fire in certain order, STDP change weights between those cells. And during sleep, the same pattern is repeated and um, replay kind of perfectly match what was done during training. What we are trying to do is a bit ugly system because we um, use one way of training back probe. And it doesn't mean that uh, order of cell spiking, which is kind of resulted from back probe, would actually um, be natural for local plasticity, STDP or Haben, or whatever we apply during sleep. So that's one of the reasons why possibly that approach is not, I mean, put another way around. So if we could use local training, that's why I would like to try it. We hopefully may get better performance and better results because we would have that total contradiction between how we train network and how we organize sleep replay. Okay, thank you. And another uh, small questions may be connected what is the, uh... The spiking, the word spiking that you mentioned. Do you think spiking is essential here? Can it could it be modeled without spiking? Um we we use spiking because I mean in a sense, um we're not using kind of much more beyond having some sort of heavy side type activation function. So we just have a neuron on on off and that we need to implement heaven plasticity because that's the way it works. So it's not sort of gradual, even those rat synapses, which works in a gradual way. Um, so I think that conception of, again, having neurons either spiking or not, in our implementation is, is important because this is needed for our plasticity rule to be implemented. Mm -hmm. Um, if the whole thing can be done, that's kind of some, uh, not even real effort, some discussions we have in the lab for a long time. If we can implement something like sleep or some sort of regularizer added to loss function. So instead of actually going for all this second separate phase and uh, yeah, kind of yeah. kind, uh, plasticity, et cetera, and, and spiking subnetwork, we can get something like what sleep is doing um, using some extra term to the loss function and so on. That would be nice from perspective of uh, kind of machine learning. Um, we, we have zero success so far. And for some reason, again, biology implemented sleep as a separate phase, which not very resource efficient if you think about that, like spending 30% of time being basically offline. Uh, so maybe it's only way to achieve what was mentioned, like proper optimization, regularization, et cetera, of the memories. Uh, again, it's long answer for short question. So we we kind of need spiking network to some degree, but not much of that. We really just need a notion of uh, activation, which would be event based, and um, and uh, then we can implement our rule, and that's that's about it. So what we, mm -hmm. for example, the PyTorch, we simply replace the loop by heavy side and and uh, uh, put some some kind of asynchronous noisy input for the network. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. Thank you. Um, maybe I, I remember, Ross, you switched on your camera. Did you have something on your heart? Possibly a bit long winded, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Maxim, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I'd like to induce you to speculate a little. Um, I, it's not my area, but I, I had noticed that some of the people talking about um, catastrophic uh, forgetting were 
uh, putting the root cause as being the use of a, a global loss function. You know, their, their argument was that by training to a specific loss function, which didn't know about the existence of multiple tasks, uh, that you were pushing the, uh, the weights of the synapses around more than was desirable to, uh, to retain performance on, on other tasks. And uh, you've, as you've already said in answer to uh, Dimitri, that you know you've you found it necessary to to use backprop through this, but then looking back at at some of your slides, you had one where you were commenting on the the use of um, uh, your procedure it was effectively orthogonalizing the the representations. You had the correlation matrices between the activities of the the neurons representing different um, different stimuli, and you know from the point of view of a statistical model. Uh, Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, that uh, you know, if you've got um, you know the more orthogonal the representations of your inputs are, uh, then the easier it should be to have you know basically you, your learning process, which is using that as input, uh, which is a task-specific learning process. That you know those should actually be able to be learned with less interference, the more orthogonal those um, those inputs are, input representations are. So I wonder whether effectively splitting your the task into two components. So you know, the first component is essentially autoencoders. So you know, getting back to what um, Evgeny and uh, Dimitri, I think, were, were saying about uh, you know, having some sort of auto-associative memory, which is basically learning the structure of the inputs, but then trying to transform them to an, as orthogonal a representation as possible. And the, the sleep phase might be essential to that orthogonalization of the representations. And then only using uh, you know, something like backprop in the readout layer, which is essentially just saying, okay, I'm trying to learn mappings from inputs to task specific outputs. So I'm wondering whether whether you've had any thoughts along along those directions or whether you think that might be any use? I mean, I probably, uh, the short answer would be, I don't know. What we know is that, because um, typically the way we do it, obviously there are some parameters of um, sleep, some hyperparameters, which uh, we need to tune to some degree. Uh, we cannot, I mean, how we scale weights and certain other things. So uh, what we notice is that when, when we, um, we usually use some genetic algorithms or whatever for, for that, and then it's it's very nicely generalizable to other inputs and so on. We don't need to obviously do it all the time. But uh, those which we found working well typically leads to largely to kind of um, uh, reducing synaptic weights. Moving, if you look at the distribution, we normally see some weights small one going possibly to the positive direction, but lots of ways going in the negative direction, which is probably why we see this uh, kind of spasming of the uh, of the activations in, in our network after sleep, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we actually try now to implement what we call multi-phasic multi sleep. When we, um, for example, during phase one, we um, will try to uh, use this kind of uh, trend to reduce weights in general, which uh, possibly meaning, I don't know if it yet means optimization or not. I mean, I I, I, I really like this direction, um, but um, I don't have hard evidence to say yes or no. But what we, we know is that, um, yeah. for example, the most recent task, typically what happens in continuous learning framework, yeah. most recent task taking over the network after post train. So what happens when we apply first phase of SRC as we present here, it generally reduce weights and to a large degree it reduce weights of the last task. So instead of taking over of everything what was presented, it started to be more kind of focused on, okay, I'm kind of waving here, on what is what is actually related to the task. But that leads to some sort of maybe over damage to that task itself. And um, what we're trying to explore, if we can add second phase of SRC, which would be focused on potentiation, uh, just because we put some constraints. Okay. And we hope that um, we have some evidence that it actually can bring performance of all tasks back to what it was, because we usually lose a little bit something without uh, having that task again, taking over the whole network. Again, 
is it like REM versus non REM sleep? Maybe, but we don't have um, direct evidence for that. Is it, um, it? It's clearly all this changes the representation of the memories and um, it, it's moving points in this uh, in this phase uh, kind of um, in, in the space of weights. Um, it's probably analogy with again that artificialization is is correct. I like it. Um, but I don't really have any direct evidence as maybe we should explore it more uh, to, um, well, we, we should uh, to, to kind of say this is what happening happening in the network. But um, that's definitely our, one of our directions which we're trying to pursue is to understand what, what actually happens because of that. And hopefully it maybe can help to uh, replace sleep phase by something uh, from machine learning perspective, more efficient or some, some regularizers or whatever. Thank All you. right. Um, I think it's time to wrap up. So now it's quarter past uh, 10 p.m. here in Sweden. <laughs> and uh, I see we uh, start to lose some people in the audience. But uh, it was really great discussion. And uh, thank you very much indeed, Maxim, once again for your talk. Uh, thank you. I, I, it was uh, very inspirational. Uh, so And thank you all for attending. So see you in two weeks from now. So thank you very much. See you next Thank time. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye bye.